your son Jesus. We get to recommit all of us, everything, our thoughts, our bodies, our lives. We get to do this every day. And we thank you for that privilege. We thank you, God, for that blessing. We thank you, God, that we wear this garment of salvation for what you've done for us, Jesus. We remember you, Father. Help us to live our lives like that for you, God. And as we've been singing, what a wonderful name. What a beautiful name. And we're going to sing what a powerful name because that is a powerful name. And we stand on your truth, Father. We stand on you, Jesus. We stand on who you are, God. My body for your body, my blood for your blood. We lay our lives down in Jesus' name. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is.
rainbow the other day. You know when there's a rainbow and the people post it and go, that's God's promise, right? That's God's promise. And so I'm walking and I see this beautiful, massive rainbow. And then as I go to take the picture, half of it's covered. As I walk a little bit, the whole thing's covered. Does that mean it's gone? No, it doesn't mean it's gone. Does that mean God's promise is gone? No. Does that mean that sometimes life can cloud us? Sometimes diagnosis can cloud us. Sometimes things that happen can cloud us. It doesn't mean God's promise is gone. It means God's promise is still there. We can't always see it, but His promise is still there. And I feel so strongly this morning to just remind you that His promise is still there. And whatever you're standing on, whether that's help, whether that's disappointments, whether that's betrayal, whether that's, um, you know, I don't know, looking for jobs. There's so many things, addictions, uh, breakdown of relationships, or, you know, you're praying for a family member to know Christ. All these things are on these prayer requests. And whatever that is for you, Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So right now, wherever you're standing, whatever you're standing in, that you can't see that rainbow because a bunch of dark clouds have covered it for you and has made that glossy in your head or foggy in your head or gray in your head or dark in your head. We break that in Jesus' name. I declare the promise over whatever you're standing in now in Jesus' name. The promise of breakthrough. The promise of healing. The promise that He is with you and He has never left you. In Jesus' name, I pray that you feel Him. I pray that you encounter Him. That diagnosis to be gone now in Jesus' name. Healing and restoration in your body now in Jesus' name. Guys, in this right now, I've already asked for permission. But in this right now, I want you to all put your hand out to Charlotte. Charlotte's the girl there with the black and the white jacket on over there. Pastor Clinton and Pastor Leah's youngest daughter. Who's 18, mind you? Just turned 18. Right. Last week, Charlotte went for an ultrasound and it came back that, oh, it's clear, but she's got this pain. And so Leah's like, no, let's do it again, right? So they go to the doctor again, a different one, get an ultrasound. And there's a 3.7 centimeter cyst in her ovary that wasn't there. And we can go, okay, yep, let's wait for a month because we need to see how it grows and if it's still there. But right now, we're going to declare that that dissolves without pain in Jesus' name, causing no disruption, causing nothing to the ovary. In Jesus' name, we pray for complete dissolving, complete healing, no more pain. It be gone now in Jesus' name. It dissolves, Lord, because you take it away, not because she feels pain. So the next time she goes... It is not there, Father, but it's clearly actually not there. Not there in Jesus' name. May this pain go and may she feel complete healing. May she have complete healing in Jesus' name. And we pray that for that over every single life here. In Jesus' name, whatever needs to be dissolved, whatever needs to be taken away, whatever needs freedom, chains be broken, bondages be just broken, gates and, and prison gates be open wide through your praise. And that's what we're doing with the shout of God. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Shout unto God with a voice of praise. Just shout now. Your shout. sovereign God and we give you glory God because we know even when we are facing things that you give us the hope you give us your hope Jesus by your stripes we are healed and you give us your hope your freedom father in your name amen amen giving now and and I really I really felt that 
through our giving, as, as we've spoken so many times, our tithe is 10%, our tithe is um, obedience, not obligation. And we've been speaking all this like for the last seven weeks, I think it's been, on Psalm 119. And that has all been obedience. It's all been knowing God's way. Yes, Tash, it's all been that. That's what we have been learning about. That's what we've been diving into. They're the scriptures every single day that Pastor Paul's been putting up and, and teaching us the meaning behind it, the breakdown behind it. It's been amazing. And then it's been seven weeks. And that's what we give to because Christ was our first, was God's first for us. And that's what he gave us. So that's what we do. It's not like me convincing you that you've got to give your first. It's not me convincing you that you've got to give your tithe. I might sit here and go, you know, God says to be of a generous nature. So it's it's tithe and offering. It's tithe and offering. It's not offering and offering. It's tithe and offering. So I don't want to sit here and convince you of that. That's not, my role is not to convince you because God's already saved your life. God's already given you His first. So out of that is what we give our first. Give our first in everything. Give our first in who we are. Give our first in our finances. Give our first of us. Because it's all His anyway, amen? So as the ashes come up, thank you, Father. We just thank you for this tithe. We thank you for every hand that has blessed this house with their offering and given this house their tithe, whether that's online, whether that's in cash in hand on the day, Father, we just thank you for blessing them, God. We thank you, Lord, that it all goes to your kingdom, Father, not our own agenda, but your kingdom, Father. And we thank you that you bless this amount, God. We thank you that it can go out into the community and beyond more than what we could ever imagine, Father. So we just thank you, God, for your blessings on this. Thank you, God, for your blessing on every single person that calls this house home and gives to this house, Father, in your name. Amen. to see through Langford. Yes, give yourselves a clap. Welcome yourselves. All right, name changes youth. Oh yeah, all right, youth corner. In this corner over here, Miles is keeping the seats warm for all the youth. Yes, so that is the youth corner over there after service. They're also running, they're also having a lunch today. After church, the youth will be meeting at Guzman and Gomez. Do I say that right? Guzman and Gomez. The Mexican place up in Carousel. <laughs> All right, Guzman and Gomez. For more info, see Millie. Millie's going to hold up her hand now. See Millie if you want more info of where that is. But it's that big building um, on the corner of, yeah, near McDonald's, Albany Highway area. So if you need more information, though, on where that is, please ask Millie. Otherwise, all youth, you're having lunch there today. For more information, yep, see Millie. <laughs> and don't forget your bottles for containers for change. All proceeds are going to teachers. So we're starting to approach schools and wanting to go in there and just bless teachers for all they're doing and everything they're going through at the moment. So that's where your containers for change is going. And we're starting to make so some money that we can actually buy a couple of things for the teachers. So just keep your containers coming in and Millie turns them into change. All right, baptism service. We are having baptism service on the 14th of August, right? Yes, that's exciting. It's so exciting. Like, You've got to give more of a clap for that because come on. It's a baptism. It's getting saying, you know what? I'm old. I was old and I've got a new creation in Christ. That's an amazing thing to do, an amazing thing to witness. So if you haven't done it yet, please come and speak to me after service. Otherwise, you can contact Pastor Clinton during the week if that's what you pray on and go, yep, you know what? That's me. Just please let us know and then we will go through the, the, the appropriate steps with you. And then it's the 14th of August here at the church. All right, church fundraising. So we have been fundraising. We've been fundraising, not that it's going to something specifically, but, you know, through everything that we need, we've, there's so much maintenance that needs to go on in this church. That's the truth, right? There's so much maintenance that needs to go on in here. There's so many things that need to happen. And 
we don't want to just keep going, oh, you just need to keep giving. Oh, you just need to keep giving and doing this and doing this and all that other stuff. But my mum over there right at the back in the corner, she, knowing everybody knows that she does cooking for our Love Langford and the community, and she was starting, was going, to, well, started her own like little business, right? It's called Nuna's, I think it's at the back of me, called Nuna's Homemade. But she wanted to donate her first um, $1,000 to the church and she has been baking and baking and baking and using her funds to do the the bags and all the ingredients and all that sort of stuff and the logos and everything and she wanted to donate so she's got we're finishing that today for a while you, yeah it's awesome yeah let's cut that and believe me I know because she'll message me at 10 o'clock at night and go I've just finished baking I'm just I'm like nah, go to bed right <laughs> anyway anyway she's baking every day so if you do know people like I know Viv had some orders through her work if you do have people at your work or you go they're most amazing Italian biscuits that you do not get in the stores who's had them because I know that you have all come back for seconds and thirds and fourths and fifths tenths yeah so this is the the last day for a while just um, because we've been doing it since June and I think mum needs just a tiny bit of a break for just a month, but then we'll come back again. But she's got so many, so we've got different um, packages, like a dollar for a cookie. Do we have the dollar ones, mum? No, we don't. Okay, so bags for $10 to $20 and you can get the tray for 20 or bags from 10 to 20 So it is all going to the church. She is giving her time and that's what I'm saying, her first. That's what she's done. In that, she's been able to give her first of her time and of her finances are going into that. So we pray that it blesses my mum when she goes into actually doing her business. Yes, we want to we want to bless that. But we also want to acknowledge that it's going to the church and fundraising for the church. So go and buy your bags so she can run out of that by today. But if you want to order or you know people that want to order, if you've got a function you want to order, still go to her um, and contact her and she will still do it for you. But anyway, just wanted to just brag on that for a moment. I am going to pass over to Pastor Clinton. I need to stand, let's bless you. Because I know we say we're going to pray, but then we don't. So let's do it right now. Father, we release the blessing of God over her business. That, Lord, you would bless the work of her hands as she's sown into your church. God, we can never outgive you. Ask for a hundredfold increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. <clears throat> Come on. Yeah, can bring it up. Yeah. Hey, listen. So we're going to introduce our guest speaker uh, today, uh, Pastor Bin, a guy that I met on a pastor's retreat. Uh, but just really uh, connected with his heart and with his spirit. He's the pastor of, uh, well, first of all, he's a, he's a husband uh, to his wife, Tran, and their beautiful kids, Oliver, Cameron, I think, and Matilda. And then he's a pastor of Sun Life Church in Leadable area, just making a transformational impact in that community. So we are just really excited to have you. He's a friend, like I said, and you are going to enjoy how he unpacks the Word of God so just, I want you to lean into that space today. Hear Jesus. Don't just hear a speaker. Hear Jesus speaking to your heart, to your spirit. Pastor Ben, why don't we welcome him? I will. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving this community so much. Thank you so much for all your love. Uh, thank you. Yes. The, uh, the honor to be here. Um, my name is Ben, and I, I lead Sun Life Church, and I'm married to my lovely wife, and we have three children. I think there's a photo of them on the screen. Um, uh, there they are. That's uh, Tran, my lovely wife. She's at church. Uh, she's so gracious to release me. Uh, once a month, I'm usually preaching around town, and she releases me and my three children. Oliver is 13, and there's Cameron. Uh, 11, and little Matilda, Tilly, we call her Tilly, and she'll be six next week. So uh, that's our family. Um, very blessed to have a lovely wife who is a uh, behind-the-scene wife who just prays and encourages and um, helps me to keep being faithful in loving God's people. Uh, Pastor Clinton, thank you so much, and, and the entire leadership team for entrusting me with this moment. I don't take this moment lightly. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, unpack the Word of God. I, I love your heart. I, I love your generosity. Every time we spend time together, I really see that there is a, uh, like you've got a pastor's heart 
you know, like you're a pastor's pastor, and I thank you so much how you model humility so well. You model that so well, and that encourages me. And, you know, we can joke around, but then there's a moment where we can really just be uh, fearful of the Lord and what He's doing. So thank you so much for modeling that to me. Um, we're going through Psalms 119. Uh, that was the passage that was given to me. I, I know as a church, you're going through this amazing chapter, right? You, you should know by now that the, the author is using the 22 Hebrew alphabet, yeah? And so there are 22 sections, and each section there are eight units. So I'm given Heth, the eighth uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so if you have your Bible, this is a good time to open up to Psalms 119 from verses uh, 57 to 46. And as I was studying this during the week, uh, the, the message that I have for you is this amazing word where when Jesus satisfies our soul, so in other words, when Jesus is all that we have, He's all that we need, that when the world strips away everything, and all we have left with Jesus, He's more than enough. And when, so when you live like that, I see in the text there are four things that takes place. Number one is that we embrace God's Word. In other words, whatever is in the Word of God, we love God's Word and we follow God's Word. We are not just hearers, but doers, as the Apostle James would say. Number two, we endure hardships. Whatever suffering, whatever hardship we endure, because He satisfies our soul. Number three, we're eager to praise. And number four, yeah, we will exist in community. They're the four things I want to unpack with you as we study the Word of God together. So I'm going to pray and ask God's Spirit to be our great teacher and ask God to help me to expound His Word with clarity, with passion, with authority. So let's pray. Father God, I thank You for this moment. I thank You for the joy to just really teach Your Word. And I do pray that I will teach your word well, and I will teach your word faithfully, and I will stick true to what you say to us in Scripture. And I pray for this congregation, that they will lean in, that they will hear your voice and not mine, and that we'll leave this morning loving Jesus even more. It's never been about the preacher, it's never been about the service, or the worship song, or the pastor, or the building, but about you, the author or the perfecter of our faith, that we will leave this morning loving Jesus more. So would you help me in this time? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, are we ready to go? Is your Bible open? All right, so notice at the very beginning, verse 57, he starts off by saying, The Lord is my portion. You see, for the original audience, the Hebrew audience, when they think of portion, the first thing they think of is real estate. They think of land. They think of the promises of God in the Old Testament where God says, I will give you land, the place where there's flowing milk and honey, remember? And so for God's people, every time they thought of portion, it's been about land, property, real estate. But if you know your Bible, there was one tribe that God did not give them land. They were the Levites. You see, they were the priests. They were the chosen group of people where God said, you're not getting land, you're actually getting me. You see, their portion was God Himself. So everyone else were given land, right? But the priests, the Levites, they were given God Himself. They were set apart. They were God's chosen. And they did not depend upon the material blessings or the land. They depended on the presence of God. Now, if I take that theme into the New Testament... The Apostle Peter, he says this in 1 Peter. So go there with me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter says this, But you, so he's speaking to the Christians, and he's speaking to, I guess, us today. You, Langford C3, you are chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are priests. You are a holy nation. You are God's possession that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. So we take that theme from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We are the chosen. We are the ones set apart. We are the priests, which means that our portion, listen carefully, is not land. It is not material blessing. It's not health and wealth. Our portion is God Himself. Amen? Therefore, when Jesus is all that we have, He's all that we need. When we live knowing that if I have nothing 
But I still have Jesus. He is more than enough. He satisfies my soul. Therefore, I'm not chasing the wealth of this world. In fact, I don't need to chase relationship because the greatest person I need is Jesus. So if you are single and you think that, oh, when I have someone, then I'm satisfied. No. You can still be single and have Jesus. You're satisfied. If you're waiting for that next investment property, no. You have Jesus. You're satisfied. And when you're waiting for the pay rise or the next promotion, no. You have Jesus. You're satisfied. And when you have the one who satisfies your soul, you will, number one, embrace the Word of God. Because I see that in the text. The text says this, the Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I'm going to hold on to your words. 58, I implore your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promises, according to your words. 59, when I think of your ways, I turn my feet towards your decree. In other words, your laws, your words. It's been all about you. Whatever you say, I'm doing. Verse 60, I Hurry and do not delay to keep your commandments. So everything the psalmist is saying is that you satisfy me, therefore I embrace everything you say. Therefore it's all about you. I will keep your words. I will follow your decree. I will obey your command. The attitude is that you are so precious to me that I want more of your word. And the more I read your word, the more I want it. You know, I used to um, remember back in the day when I was dating uh, this beautiful girl who is now my wife. We've been married for 20 years now. So, yeah, God is kind. God is kind. So, 25 years ago, when we were still dating, my wife, Tran, would keep a little journal. And she'll write in the journal, you know, as you begin to fall in love, you begin to write every day, you know, the experiences, the feeling. And she would write down how blessed she was to, I guess, be dating the most attractive Asian man in Perth, right? Come on, preach it, right? Preach it. And she's writing down her feelings. And when I used to, I used to be a high school teacher, so I used to work afar out in the country. She would miss when I was working afar. And she longed for those moments where we would speak on the phone. Back in the day, there was this thing with Optus where you can speak for 20 minutes for free. And you speak and you hang up and you call again. You know that. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you stop when the phone and your ear gets a bit too hot. That's when you stop, right? But she'll write moments where things wasn't too good, moments where I kind of disappointed her, moments where I kind of hurt her feelings, and uh, she wrote it all down. I remember the moment where I had a chance to read the journal, and as I read the journal, I, I saw my wife's feelings, and I realized how much she loved me, and I realized the moments where I messed up, the moments where I said things I shouldn't have said, but because I realized how much she loved me and how much she really cared about me, I, 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 wanted, I wanted to change. I want to do the things that would help grow this relationship. I didn't want to disappoint her. I embraced what she wrote. And that's the same with you and I. As we read the Word of God, as we dive into the Word of God, we should fall in love over and over again with the central character who is the living Word, Jesus. So we begin to love Jesus more because He loved us first. And we begin to realize, oh, these are the areas that I need to change because if I keep doing this, I'm going to really fracture this relationship with the one who loves me, the one who satisfies my soul. Therefore, I want to change. I want to be transformed by the Word of God. I long to read the Word of God. I want to study the Word of God. I want to meditate and ponder and really love His Word. And so the same psalmist, the same author would write this in the same chapter in verse 97. Go there with me. He says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditated on it all day long. He says, I love your word. I love your law. I love your decree. I love your commandments. And I want to meditate on it all day long. I want to embrace it. I want to receive it because I know that as I study your word, I see the plans and the purposes you have for me. And so my encouragement for us as God's people is that we must love his word. We must be reading his word. We are satisfied in Him because we know He's so good that as we read His Word, we realize how much He loves us and how good He is, and we embrace His Word, and we live out His Word, and there are areas that we need to change. James says that when you read the Word of God, it's like looking in a mirror. Because when you look in a mirror and you see there's a mark on your face, you wipe off that mark. 
If you look into the mirror and you realize there's something wrong, you change. But if you're not reading the Word of God, you're not looking in the mirror, and you don't know where you're going, let's not be Christians that the only time we open up the Word of God is on Sunday when the pastor tells us to open up the Word of God. And the rest of the week, we never open up the Word of God. But when He satisfies our soul, and we realize how much He loves us and how good He is, we want to embrace His Word. We want to be people where the psalmist says, I meditate on your word all day long. I love your laws. I love your commandments. I love your decree. I want to find time in the busyness of my life to slow down, to take a deep breath, and enjoy your presence through your word and believe that you will speak to me through Scripture. And that's what I see right here. And I believe that when he satisfies your soul and my soul, we want to be in his word. We want to embrace and there'll be moments where it's a bit challenging, but we will still embrace it. Amen? Because that's what the psalmist did. Number two, when Jesus satisfies our soul, we endure hardships. Look at verse 61. It says, Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. It's a picture of someone being trapped by the wicked. There is a cord that is holding this person the psalmist says that the wicked, he's got a hold of me, I cannot escape. It's a picture of suffering. It's a picture of hardship. It's a picture when life is quite challenging. But what does he say? I do not forget your law. I am not going to forget you. I'm not going to forget the promises of your word. I don't like my situation. I don't like what is before me. But I'm not going to let that overshadow the promises of your word. What is before me? I don't like. I don't like what I see in my eyes, but my heart reminds me that your promise is that you've got me. The promise is that you're with me in that dark shadow. You go before me. So I'm going to keep trusting in you, and I'm going to keep enduring, and I'm going to get through that hardship. Come on, let's be honest, church. Some of us, we need to realize that following Jesus, it's got its good moments and not so good moments. I mean, that's what we know, right? When we love Jesus, there's going to be great moments and not so good moments. And maybe for some of you this morning, you are in the middle of that season of hardship. Maybe for some of you, you're going out of that season of hardship. And maybe for some, we're going into that season of hardship. See, hardship takes in different shapes and form for every one of us. For some of us, it's the temptation that keeps getting us. There's a temptation that keeps getting you. Or that addiction that you're trying to overcome, but it's always there. Or the illnesses that seem to not go away. Or maybe it's the financial security you're longing for, and right now there's issues with finance, or brokenness in relationship, in your marriage, in your family, and even in the church. Or maybe it's persecution as you proclaim your faith. Every one of us, we know what hardship is, because we've either experienced it, we're in the middle of it, or we're going out of it. But let me say this, when Jesus satisfies your soul and my soul, we can endure hardship. You know why? Here's why. Because Jesus says that we can rejoice always. See, Paul says this in prison to the Philippians, that you are to rejoice in the Lord always. I say rejoice in the Lord always. That's him in prison. In Nehemiah, Nehemiah, when he's rebuilding the temple wall, right, he says that the joy of the Lord is my strength in the midst of opposition, saying you're crazy. They endured hardship because they know ultimately God gives them the joy. You know, when He satisfies your soul, which means that you are depending upon Him and not the things around you. You can still find joy in Him when you have nothing and there's hardship before you. Well, there's joy, so you keep enduring. You go through hardship because He is the one who satisfies you. And I see that in the text. But here's the, way, the amazing thing, that the one who satisfies our soul, Jesus, this is what He said in the gospel. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, be encouraged to know that the one who satisfies your soul 
and my soul is the same one who's overcome the world. He's overcome the world so that we can keep moving forward. If he didn't overcome the world, if he didn't overcome sin, if he didn't overcome suffering, if he didn't overcome Satan on that cross and resurrection, then we're in trouble. But because he have, then I'm going to keep moving forward. So as I move forward, I'm going to endure whatever suffering, hardship that is before me. That's okay. But what does the Apostle Paul say? He says that for every suffering, there is a purpose. Go with me to Romans 5, 3 and 6. Paul says this, We know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's Word has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. There's a purpose. You go through some hardship, He's building your perseverance. As He builds your perseverance, He's molding your character. As your character grows, you have more hope. And He doesn't disappoint. There's a reason behind our hardship. So if we keep moving forward, if we keep trusting God and endure it, we come out the other end with more hope, with more character, with more perseverance. You know, I, I grew up as a refugee boy. I came here on a fishing boat. We left Vietnam after the Vietnam War in the late 70s. I got here in 1981, 41 years ago. Don't look like it, right? Look like I'm 16, eh? Look like I'm 16. <laughs> and we grew up in poverty. You know, I didn't have a lot. My mum and dad had to work very, very hard. Never saw them. Never went on holidays. Ate very simple meals. Grew up in Mirabuka in the northern suburbs. Went to Mirabuka Senior High School in the late 80s, 90s. Can't believe I got out of that school alive. <laughs> the grace of God. Hallelujah. But now I know why. Now I know why those years of just hardship and enduring is because to plant a church to lead God's people who are broken is not easy. But I'm so grateful that that was a season that I endured so that He's prepared me and given me that perseverance and character and trust and hope in Him to do His work today. You see, God, He is, he is wise. And so whatever suffering, whatever hardship you're in, don't give up. Don't say, oh, woe to me. God has forgotten me. It's too hard. I will just pack my bag and just dig a hole and just die. No. You endure hardship. Why? He still loves you. He's the one who satisfies you. And He has a purpose in your hardship because ultimately it's for His glory. So this season is a hard season that you cannot see what He's doing. But trust me, time is a wonderful thing because as time moves by, you're going to realize what He's up to. And He has a purpose. He has a purpose for you, for the people around you, and for His glory. And so we keep doing what we do. We keep praying. We keep trusting. We keep coming to church on Sunday. We keep plugging into our small group. We keep serving. We keep worshiping when it's hard to worship. We keep serving when it's hard to serve. We keep enduring hardship because He ultimately loves us and He's got a purpose. In fact, Paul says this in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, not some things, all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who has been accord according to His purpose. He knows what He's doing. He's God. So we endure. So we keep moving forward. I believe this is a word for some of you here this morning. Maybe right now, you know, you came here and you're going, well, I just needed that, Bin, because, yeah, I'm in the middle of some hardship right now. Slow down. Take a deep breath and realize that, yeah, He satisfies you. If you have nothing but you still have Him, He's more than enough. So you keep moving forward. You keep enduring whatever hardships before you. And I guarantee you, He knows what He's doing. He has a purpose. Okay? One of my elders, let me finish this story here. One of my elders in my church lost his first son at the age of 15 months. I, had, I, I remember burying little Ethan. It was so hard. I cried with him. I questioned the love of God. I questioned what was going on. But today... In church, when we've had incidents where someone's lost a child or something has happened, my elder, he understands. 
He's been there. He empathized. He sympathized. He didn't like losing his son, but he can see how God has used him to draw people back to him. Whatever season you're in right now, like the psalmist says, the enemy may have a cord, but he says that I will not forget your word. I will keep moving forward. I may not like what I'm seeing before me, but I'm not going to let that overshadow the promises of your word, that you've got this. Amen? Number three, he says this, when Jesus satisfies our soul, we're eager to praise. Look at verse 62. At midnight, I rise to praise you because of your righteous ordinance. The psalmist says here, he got up at midnight to praise God. I don't know about you, but I would not be calling this man here at midnight. He's having his beauty sleep. I would not be calling him. It will be such an inconvenience for me to be calling him. The psalmist says right here that my heart and my mind is filled with joy and thankfulness, and I know that worshiping you is more precious than the precious hours of my sleep. That I do not want to wait for the convenience of the next morning to worship you. I want to worship you right now, and it's midnight. I, I love that. When Jesus satisfies our soul, we want to worship Him all the time and any time, and it's not about our convenience. It's not about when I feel like worshipping. Oh, it's got to be on a Sunday morning because that's the time that I sing and clap and be full of joy. But say, Monday to Saturday, there's none of that at home. Oh, it has to be the convenience of when the worship person sings my song, the song that has really spoken to me. So when that song is on the song list for that Sunday, I'm going to shout a hallelujah. Oh, it's not the convenience of the fact that there's other people singing with me And as they sing loud, I want to sing loud. It's not the convenience of, well, the pastor tells me to sing, so I better sing. The psalmist says right here that you are so good that my heart wants to praise you, not at my convenience, but even at my inconvenience. Midnight. I'm not going to wait for 6 o'clock in the morning. Because for the Hebrew people, 6 o'clock is when they want to get up and praise and sing and pray to God. But he's saying, no, I'm not going to wait. I want to do it now. I want to sing right now at midnight. So friends, let me say this. Do not let our convenience determine when we want to praise Him. Let, the Word of God says, your righteous ordinance determine my praise. In other words, let what you say about yourself, what you have done, I want to praise based on that. And if I know how good He is, and I know what He's done for me, I will praise Him every time and any time. And even if it's on the bus and it seems a bit awkward and inconvenient, I'm going to praise Him. Hey, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I will do it at 3 o'clock in the morning. And we need to understand that. But I want to show you something else. Notice what the text says. He got up. He rise up. It's intentional. He wasn't praising God in bed. He wasn't lying down and praising God or praying to God. The Bible says he got up. He really wanted to do it. It was intentional. It really meant something to him. It's going to cost him something. That's what praise is all about. You really want to do it. You want to sing a praise to him. You might not like it, but you know what? Your feelings is not going to determine when you praise. It's never been about us. It's been about him. Amen. When someone says to you, well, I don't feel like singing. I don't feel like clapping. I don't feel like praising. When has it ever been about us? When has it ever been about us? It's been about Him. He's the one that we are praising. And it doesn't matter sometimes in our praise, we don't feel like doing it. We get up and we do it. Because how good He is. You know, sometimes we praise God because of what God has done, which is great. It's a praise of celebration, just like in the Bible when God delivered the people out of Egypt, they praised. Or when Mary realized she was pregnant, she praised. Or when Elizabeth realized she was pregnant, she praised. But sometimes we need to be like Paul in prayer in anticipation when things are tough. Paul was in prison and he was still praising because he was anticipating what God would do. So for some of us, listen carefully. When we praise God, 
don't praise God because we feel like praising God, because it's our convenience. Oh, because he's done a good work for us during the week. Oh, I got that promotion. Woohoo! I'm going to come on Sunday and praise God. No, no, no. For some of us, God has not done anything yet, but you're praising in anticipation for what he's been doing and what he's going to do. So it's never been about what I'm feeling. It's been about him. It's about his righteous ordinance. What he says in Scripture I may not experience it right now, but I still hold to the promise of His Word, and I'm going to praise Him in anticipation to what is around the corner. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number four, when Jesus satisfies our soul, we exist in community. Look in verse 63 and 64 as we finish this passage. I am a companion or friends with all who fear you. To those who keep your precepts, the earth, O oh Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. So what he says, he finishes off that, that particular passage by saying, God, I'm with all my friends, all the people who fear you. You see? We all honor you. We all respect you. We keep your ways. We hold into your word. We love you. Friends, when Jesus satisfies our soul, we want people to know this Jesus. It doesn't happen when we're living solo. When we're in community, we get to remind each other of the one who satisfies our soul. We get to help each other follow the one who satisfies our soul. We get to encourage each other to keep trusting the one who satisfies our soul. But when we are living by ourselves, individualism, it kills because there's no one for us to share and encourage. And that's what I see in the text. That's the reason why when God created us in His image, He created us to be in community. Because Father, Son, Holy Spirit operated in community before the foundation of the world. That's why when He created Adam, He gave Adam an Eve. Genesis 2, 18, the Lord said, It is not good for a man, Adam, to be alone. It's not good for you to live in isolation. It's not good for you to live in that cyber world and it's just interaction between you and some people online. It's not good for us to be staying at home and going, well, I don't want to come to church because I'm comfortable watching church on my sofa. I don't want to be part of a connect group because I don't want people into my space. The Bible says right here, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. See, God knew that fellas, I'm speaking to the fellas now, that if you didn't have someone special in your life, you are a total wreck. I know of guys in my church who God has graced them and blessed them with a beautiful lady. They change. They smell nicer. <laughs> they dress better. Yeah. And they're more cleaner. Why? Because God has given them someone to help them, someone to encourage them, someone to point out blind spots. Hey, you know what? Your hair's a bit everywhere. Get some product. When was the last time you went down to the shop and got some deodorant? You know? You see, when Jesus called the disciples to Him, He called them into community. The disciples were a community of 12. When Jesus called the early church, he also called them into community, read Acts. They lived together, they did life together, they shared their possession together. When you read through church history, when the church was scattered, they were called into community to encourage each other to keep fixing their eyes on their Savior. You and I, we also exist in community. We need each other. No matter how broken this community is, and it is a broken community, I always say to my pastor friends that my church, I think, is the most messed up church. Yeah, I think it is. It doesn't look like that on Sunday. It doesn't look like that on social media, but it is pretty messed up. You name it, I've seen it. But one thing I keep telling my church is that we are broken, but we follow a perfect God. And we have each other to help us keep following Him. And that's the reason why we need to be in community. And yes, there are certain people who drive you up the wall. 
Yeah, it's okay. God placed them there to help you grow in your faith and your perseverance and your character and hope. Maybe they are the suffering that you're experiencing right now. So keep enduring the hardship with them. But don't let them go. They're there for a purpose. There is no perfect church. And if you happen, if you happen to find a perfect church, don't go there because it won't be perfect anymore. You understand that, right? So we stay. We stay and we love each other. We encourage each other. Individualism kills community. Don't be someone who lives for yourself. And this world here is not helping us. You know, in this world here, we can find people by swiping left or swiping right, whatever you swipe, you know. You can engage with people on social media. You can stay home and worship God from home. Individualism kills community. Break that. Come here. Be part of a serve team. Be part of a connect group. You are saved and I'm saved not into a spiritual vacuum. No, we're saved into a spiritual family. And this family is right here. No matter how broken it is, it is God's family and it's beautiful. And we need each other. So we invite God's people back. We invite those who are outside of God's family into His family. And even though we are broken, imperfect, sinful people, we have a complete, perfect, sinless Jesus. And He's the one who keeps us together. John says this, John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When you love each other, when you serve each other, when you forgive each other, when you pray for each other and care for each other well, Langford would see the one you're following, the one who satisfies your soul. His name is Jesus. And you stand out very different as salt and light. So those four things again. When He satisfies our soul, we embrace God's Word. Whatever we see in Scripture, we take it on. Amen. We endure hardship, no matter how hard it is. We're eager to praise, not out of our convenience. And we exist in community. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you. Maybe right now, this morning, uh, some of us, we feel that, yeah, God has spoken to us. We feel that, yeah, you're not in the Word. You're not embracing the Word. You read certain passages of Scripture and you say, well, that's not for me. I don't want to do that because that's not what I believe. That's not what I feel. But the Word of God is authoritative. It's got nothing to do with what we feel, what we believe. He knows what He's doing. So maybe this morning for some of us, God has really spoken to us that we need to embrace His Word. In fact, we need to be in His Word. Because the only time we're opening up His Word is on Sunday morning. Could that be the reason why you're struggling? Could that be the reason why there is a spiritual dryness in your walk? For some of us right now, maybe you are just struggling with your life. There is suffering, there's hardship, and you want to give up. You want to walk away and say, this is too hard for me. But God is saying, endure. Trust me. Don't look at your situation. Look at my promises in my word. When some of us here this morning, maybe um, you, just, you only praise God on Sunday. If there was a microscope on your life during the week, the word praise does not exist. Maybe God is saying, yeah, praise Him more. Praise Him at home. Praise Him at work. Praise Him during your lunch break. Praise Him before an exam. Praise Him at night. Praise Him at midnight. Or maybe for some of us here this morning, yeah, we just don't want anyone into our space. We like being by ourselves. We like being in isolation. But God says, no, you need to be in community. So I feel right now, maybe this is a good time for us to pray for each other. If you feel that, yeah, God has spoken to you, that I want to just pray for you, just for a time, I'm going to ask you to be upstanding if you need prayer, and I'm just going to pray for you all. So if that is you right now, why don't you stand up right now and let me pray for you. 
and believe that God is going to do a work in your situation. Yeah, good on you. Only do this if you want to do this because it's got nothing to do with me. My worth is not based on how many people that stands. My worth is based on the death of the Son. So if you want to stand, you stand. But it will be my joy and my honor to pray for you. Because I believe that as I pray, I pray to our Father in heaven who hears us. And He begins to change situations and spiritual climate. So that's where you stand right now. If you can't stand for a certain reason, you just raise your hands. And I know who I'm praying for. I just want to know who I'm praying for. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, you just take your time. Yeah, come on. You're worthy. He's worthy. Worthy, Lord. Love it all. Yes, anyone else who needs prayer? Come on. Are all things to you are all things. Father, you Father, you are here with us this morning. You are here with us this morning. I know that. I sense that you are doing a beautiful work in this church. You are in the business of restoring people, reconciling people, giving people second chances. You're not a condemning God. You're a gracious God. And I know what you're doing. You're drawing people back to you. And this morning, your children are standing. And they say, Father, there are areas that I need to work on. There are areas that I'm not proud of. There's areas that I feel ashamed. But Father, I know that you're a gracious God. I know that you're a loving God. A God who's slow to anger. A God of patience. Oh God. They're saying, Father, would you help me? Holy Spirit, will you empower me? Will you nail me to keep following Jesus, to overcome any fleshy desires, to live by the Spirit and not the flesh? So God, I pray for all my brothers and sisters standing this morning. This morning, they make a commitment that from this day onwards, they want to keep embracing your Word. They want to follow your Word. They want to endure hardship. They want to exist in community, God. God, they are eager to praise you, God, because they know you satisfy their soul. So, God, I pray for every single one standing right here this morning, God. Right now, Holy Spirit, do a work right now. Uh, restore brokenness right now. Oh, God, do a work right now, God. They are worshiping. They are receiving right now, God. I pray for Lakewood C3. This church here will be an amazing hub for people to come to meet you, to meet the God who restores, meet the God who redeems and ransom. So, God, I pray for the leadership. I pray for all the pastors. I pray for all the community leaders, God, that you give them power, give them strength to do your work. Thank you, Jesus. You restore. You satisfy. You complete us. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. Lakewood Church, would you be upstanding? Let's worship God. Let's sing. 